on the road of recovery with Sarah from Cincinnati. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm good. How are you? Fantastic. Thanks so much for coming out. Uh, getting started, can you describe a bit of your childhood? Sure. Um, like you said, I'm from Cincinnati. I grew up on the west side um, from the suburbs. I'm an only child um, and also an only grandchild and an only niece. Um, and I mentioned that just because of all of the uh, individualized attention I got, which I think kind of um, gave me a false sense of like what life was going to be like. Um, but, you know, I, I would say I had a pretty good childhood. I wouldn't say it was typical. Um, but, you know, to me, it was what I knew. So it felt very normal. Um, I always had what I needed. I knew that my parents loved me. Um, I never felt like I wasn't going to have dinner or the lights are going to get shut off or something like my parents, um, for the most part, you know, they, they did a, a really good job. I had fun. I had friends. I went to school. I graduated from Oak Hills High School, which is on the west side of Cincinnati. Um, you know, I, I really didn't get into drugs until I was in college. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the way it happened was kind of weird. Like, I didn't know anyone that did hard drugs um, aside from this one guy. Uh, he's a friend of mine and he's really, really funny and charismatic and just easy to be around and just awesome. He handed me um, a plate with a white line on it and I just, I did it and it was heroin and um, I felt nothing. I felt warm and like nothing. Uh -huh. um, and in that moment, I, I can't say like, that's when it started. I didn't, I mean, it did, but I, I didn't <laughs> I recognize did. that. Um, but yeah, that, you know, I was like 19, I think I was, no, I was 21 years old. That's when that, that's when that first started. Okay. And how did it progress then? It progressed looking back. It was like very fast. Um, initially I would say for the first month, I didn't ever like purchase it on my own. I only got it with that friend. I only used it with that friend. I was still going to school. Um, and then I would say like that was like spring term. And then by the by winter, I was dropping out of college and I had spent my entire like uh, overage check on drugs for he and I. Mm -hmm. and what did you do to be able to support your habit then? Um, so I actually always worked in active addiction. Okay. I always worked and I would uh, I worked as a home health aide. So I had a lot of freedom because I could just take clients in my car, which is terrifying, honestly, like being wasted and driving around to this very vulnerable population. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, that's what I did. I, I worked constantly. I, I stole from my family and, um, you know, pawned everything I ever had in my life. Uh -huh. um, I, I mean, I, I pretty much did whatever I could, but I did always maintain a job, which honestly, in the long run, I feel like that kept me using longer because it made me feel like I was in control and like what I was doing. I knew what I was doing wasn't socially acceptable using heroin in any form is not socially acceptable, but because I could maintain like this outer shell of like a regular life, as in like, I have a job, an apartment and a car, mm -hmm. it made me feel like I was in control and that I was making this choice. It wasn't being made for me. And that, you know, I, I was, I was normal, you know? So the first time you asked for help, was it you asking for help? Somebody else suggesting that you need help? Um, so the first time I ever, got clean. Mm -hmm. I just moved to North Carolina. My friend knew some Marines in Jacksonville, North Carolina, mm -hmm. and we went down there and lived with them. I got arrested promptly and my dad had to come back and, and get me. I, I can't, I, I think there was a time before that, that I asked him for help, but I was, I, I have been backed into a corner by my family. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and then not, they're not really ever saying like, you need help. They're like, you're getting help. It's mm -hmm. never, it's never like a choice at that, you gotcha. know, at that point. Can you talk a little bit more of the progression of your disease? Absolutely. So aside from like crossing that threshold from like snorting it and smoking it into shooting it, um, there was like a, a time period where it switched um, from like feeling like I had a choice and like I'm having a good time and you know, this is fun to now this is totally a full-time job. Um, and I don't really want to do it anymore, but the consequence of getting clean or the consequences of uh, dope sickness, I, I didn't ever want to face that. For some reason, that that was like so intense in my brain. Mm -hmm. And though it is grueling, awful, terrible, mm -hmm. 
there's another side to that, but you know, the disease of addiction would have such a grip on me that it would tell me that like, I have to get the next one. Like, yeah, that's not a possibility. We're not going without. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't really pinpoint when that was, but definitely when I started shooting it, um, that's when things got crazy. So talk to us about the month before you got sober. Okay, for like the last time, yep. the, the final time, yep. we'll call it the yep. final time. Right. Um, okay, so I was living in Florida. Uh, that was like my, the way I got clean. I had, fa I had family in Colorado, uh, Florida, and then of course here. So I would bounce between those three states constantly, mm -hmm. um, thinking that like the drug was the problem. And if I couldn't find it easily, I'd, I'd stay clean, get clean, stay clean. Obviously I didn't, I would just get high in that city as soon as I found drugs. Mm -hmm. um, so I got to the point where my dad, you know, cut me off because I, I wouldn't get clean. I, I wouldn't stay clean and he knew I was going to die. So to protect himself, he had to just kind of sever our relationship. He loved me from afar, but we didn't have real contact. Um, and that consequence really hurt me. Uh, I, I used for months and months after that, but now that I'm clean, that, I mean, that was probably one of the driving forces was to regain that relationship. I never thought that my dad would distrust me the way he did. Mm -hmm. So I was living in Florida using with my mom and I was just like, man, I don't think we're ever going to stop. Mm -hmm. You know, it didn't really feel like I was ever going to stop. And that was more terrifying than anything. Um, more terrifying than like, oh my God, I'm out of money or, oh my God, I can't get drugs. It was like, I can get both of those things readily. Um, I don't think we're ever going to, we're ever going to stop. Um, I called my dad and he did not want to hear it. Mm -hmm. He, he was like, you know, we've done this so many times. Um, I, he just didn't believe me anymore. So that was scary. <laughs> Absolutely. So what'd you do? He, he said, I'm going to call you back the next day. Um, I called him on, I think it was June 10th. Mm -hmm. Um, I got clean on June 12th, his birthday, actually, oh, it just wow. kind of, it kind of worked out like <laughs> yeah. that. Um, he said, I'm going to call you back the next day. And that was a very long day. Um, I mean, I didn't stay clean, not at all, but, uh, he called me back the next day and he said, I have a list of conditions. They are non-negotiable, mm -hmm. um, because I'm very much a manipulator and I'll agree to anything to get what I want. And then I'm going to, you know, find a way to like backpedal and, and like, get you to be on my side, but do what I want. That's, that was like the name of my game. Okay. Um, so his conditions were, I have to go to and complete treatment. I have to be on, we didn't know about the Vivitrol shot, but I had to be on naltrexone, which okay. is the, the pill. Um, and I had to attend 12 step meetings regularly. And by regularly, he meant daily. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, I had been in 12 step recovery before he knew the process. He knew like what a sponsor was and what the steps were and stuff like that. And he wanted me to be like participate in recovery, not just go to the meetings. Mm -hmm. Um, and I agreed to all of that. And like, it, it really, that sounded more than fair. And, and I wanted it, you know, mm -hmm. I really did. I'd had enough. I'd been using for, I don't even know, like eight years by now. And I mean, I felt so just like degraded and gross and just so far from who I imagined myself to be. So where did you go? Um, got on a plane, came back to Ohio to go to treatment? Yes. Okay. Yes. Talk to us a little bit about that. Okay. So, um, I went to my, my dad picked me up from the airport with my grandma. I went to a treatment center here, uh, in Cincinnati. I only stayed in for eight days in inpatient treatment. I think that that was kind of like my first like spiritual awakening because I took an honest look at myself. I was like, are you about to leave and get high? Like, let's, let's really examine this. And I think that I did the best I could to be honest with myself. And I really wasn't going to get high. Mm -hmm. So he and I, um, he did let me come home. We came up with a new plan together. Um, and he, I, I showed him that I, that I could, you know, do a couple things for myself. Like I set up my outpatient treatment and figured out the bus and stuff like that. I've never ridden the bus in my, I'd never ridden the bus in my life. I mm -hmm. started driving. I was 16. Um, and that's, that's where I got a little bit of humility. Like I, I gotta get here. Uh, and I, and I did. So looking back, 
it, it means a ton that that's how it went, you know, and our relationship grew insane in the first set. I, I lived with him for like seven months mm -hmm. and we got so close. We did so much together and, you know, we just hung out and talked and got to know each other because he hadn't known me for real. I mean, he'd seen me, been around me, but I was not myself for like eight years. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what you did in those early days to start rebuilding trust? Yeah, I I just did what I, I said what I meant and, and meant what I said. Like, I just tried to not bullshit, you know, just do what I needed to do and not lie and just check my motives like quick because I was terrified that I was going to get high. So I started going to meetings immediately and they say that meetings reduce the shock of change and they're meaning like the shock of change of not using drugs anymore. Um, and I found that to be true, just being around other people that have you know, been through early recovery and been so uncomfortable in their own skin um, and being able to like connect with those people that know exactly what I'm going through. And it's, it's not like a theory, like, oh, you'll be okay. Just, you know, got to get through it. Cause my family, you know, they were supportive, but they had never experienced anything like that. So they did, they couldn't like give me, share their experience with me. I mean, I like, saw and did things that were so outside of normal mm -hmm. that, you know, I was, I was a different person. You know, I had to relearn what do I like? How do I act? Uh, how to be professional, how, how to be like kind and trusting and loving and like all of these things. And um, when you're struggling with something, what do you do? I'm really quick to talk about it. Um, like this morning, I was in my office with my office mate and I was really having a tough time with something and I have to talk it out. I can't hold anything in. Um, it's just, I, I don't know. It just like eats away at me and it just wrecks me mm -hmm. until I just talk it through with someone. And usually if I can connect and they can kind of give me some feedback or even just listen to me, mm -hmm. um, I feel a lot better and I feel like, okay, I, I can probably find a solution here or work toward a solution or something. Um, yeah, I, I can't, I can't just keep it in. What dreams do you have for yourself that would not have been possible in active addiction? Um, just the dream of not using anymore. Like I, I know that eight years really isn't that long for, I mean, yeah. It is. It is. It's long. It's long. It was, it felt like 50 years. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I, I've heard people share that they used for 35 years. Right. You know, I, I, I don't even know how one comes out of that. That's amazing. Um, but I felt like I had gotten to a point where there was no coming back. Mm -hmm. And just the fact that like I have recovered, mm -hmm. um, and by recovered, I don't mean like I'm healed. I just mean that I am someone that functions in society mm -hmm. um, and that I have returned to, you know, a person that is capable of like kindness and honesty. <laughs> I think my, the freedom from not having to get up, I hated that having to get up an hour before I had to be to work to, you know, make sure I could cop and it was never on time and I was always late and I was always like panicking. Mm -hmm. I don't really exist in that panic area anymore. That was like my constant state was like, either, oh my God, I'm gonna not get what I need. I'm gonna be sick at work and I'm gonna have to come up with an excuse to leave or um, they're gonna find out or, you know, just, you know, constantly living a double life or even maybe a triple life where somebody's gonna bust me and it's all gonna come undone. Mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't have that and that's so free. Absolutely. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how you rebuilt those relationships? So with like with your dad, with your extended family, how, how that happened? Yeah. I just, I started just showing up, you know, um, and not asking for things all the time. I always had my hand out always like just seeing if there was something I could do for them and, and just not using, mm -hmm. just not getting high that really has rebuilt so much of it just on its own. So for people who are out there that are still struggling, what are some words of wisdom or something that really stuck with you that you could share? I, 
I don't mean to sound negative, but honestly, there was nothing anyone could say to me okay. that would have gotten me to stop using. I had to just experience what I had to. Um, you know, I, I love that, you know, some people will hear something that, that turns them, you know, and it's like, you know what, I, that spoke to me. That never happened for me. I, I, I had to just keep going until I was done. And that sucks, you know, that's a hard road. Yep. Um, so I do hope that, you know, anyone that's still using, I really hope that you have enough quick while you still have life because it's never too late. It very much felt too late for me. Definitely not too late. Right. Living a great life. Um, but if you're dead, it's, yeah, it's too late. Right. How about this one? For somebody who's in early recovery, is there something that you could, could share that could be helpful to somebody in those, you know, first 25, 30 days of, of sobriety? Sure, yeah. Um, I really love the stick and stay. Like that sounded so stupid to me, like shut up, like stop. But truly, just just to like keep going, just to keep doing the next right thing. Um, and that's pretty simple. Like just don't use, um, like no matter what, I, I felt like, oh my God, you know, like I can't, I don't think I can probably make it through this um, without using and really using just compounds whatever issue I've ever had. It's never solved a problem. Like I do like, um, I have heard if using drugs is the solution, what's the problem? I love that, you know, like, <laughs> yes. yeah, what, what does that ever solve? You know, right. I really like that. Um, so you had mentioned about having a 12 step um, recovery. Uh, how did you work through and develop your own spirituality? That's an ongoing thing for me. It's not, it's not something that came easy. Um, you know, I, I'm kind of envious of people that can just like be religious, mm -hmm. but that's never worked for me. It just doesn't, it, I just don't connect. Um, I've tried. So I, I just, I, I guess it's easier for me to identify like what my higher power is not. Mm -hmm than what it is. Um, and I do know that my higher power wants me to stay clean um, and that they love me. So I don't really overcomplicate that. I don't, um, I don't have like this concept in my head. It's just kind of like, okay, you know, I, I do call my higher power God. I just think it's like, okay, God just is, it's just, it's just good and light and that's, that's recovery for me. So it's just kind of easy that those work together. And do you feel like because you had to work at the spirituality, uh, component that you, um, that you are able to know what you need on a kind of consistent basis? Um, I don't know. I, I know that, um, you know, like, keeping it really simple for myself that's important to not not really get too far away from the middle mm -hmm. and i guess like the middle is where i feel like i'm in line with my higher power um so maybe okay uh is there anything else that you would like to share with the audience that that we missed or something that um that, that something else you wanted to, to share with our our audience um you know i I was someone that used, um, used the, the Vivitrol shot. And when I, when I got clean, I had such like a rigid view on, um, mat treatment. Mm -hmm. Like I, I was like very, I was like ashamed, honestly. Um, but working in the recovery field and learning about harm reduction and just like different ways to recover, um, you know, I, I really love that. And I urge anyone that is considering getting clean or sober or, you know, just cutting back to like, think about that. Think about maybe it's, it doesn't have to be all or nothing immediately. Um, because that can be a little, that's, that's jarring, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's what works for me. And that's what works for like a lot of people that I know, but it's not the only way. Um, and I think, I wish that I would have known that earlier on that um, it didn't have to be so black and white, mm -hmm. you know, that I could recover um, however I wanted to, whatever mm -hmm. made sense for me. It didn't have to be a specific way. Thank you. That's very important. And being able to utilize all those different tools. I mean, you've talked about such a wide range and being able to share your experience, I very much believe will, will help somebody that's out there that's 
that's still struggling and trying to, to find their way. Um, that was beautiful. Uh, we very much appreciate you coming out today. And for those that feel that there's no hope, you are you know, very much proof that there is a way out of addiction. There is, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.